Greetings to the Aspen Ideas Festival. I'm NASA astronaut Matthew Dominic aboard the International Space Station. Although we cannot easily see Aspen with the naked eye from 260 miles above the Earth, we can see the beautiful Colorado Rocky Mountains, a place I grew up and a place I call home. As we work to advance scientific achievement, space exploration, and international cooperation, we would ask you to maximize your curiosity, forge relationships with other attendees, and continue to cooperate on developing ideas that positively impact the world. We are thinking of you from up here on the International Space Station. Congratulations on your 20th, 20th Aspen Ideas Festival. We are excited for you to keep the conversations and new ideas going. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dan Porterfield, president of the Aspen Institute, and Cesar Conde, chairman of NBC Universal News Group. Welcome, thank you all for coming together today at the midpoint of the 2024 Aspen Ideas Festival. It is so fantastic to see a packed house with so many friends. Let me please extend my gratitude to the greater Aspen community, which has come out today in force. My gratitude also to some of our youngest and most engaged participants, the Bezos scholars and the students from the Aspen Challenge who are here today. <laughs> Thank you to our trustees, thank you to our speakers, thank you to all attendees, thank you to our media partner, NBC Universal News Group, led by my friend and Aspen partner, Cesar Conde. We are so proud to be hosting this convening, which has been led by the exceptional singular sensation, Tina Brown, who you're going to hear from shortly. Now, the very first event of the Aspen Institute was held on these grounds 75 years ago tomorrow. And it was a global convening, a lot like this one, that brought together people from all professions and walks of life and interests to go deep and to think about what they thought could be the solution to the great challenges of that time in the aftermath of World War, with the rise of the Soviet system, with the experience of nuclear warfare now in the front of minds. And for them, that answer was humanism and the tradition of going deep to understand what is it that we share as human beings? What is it that we can do together? What are the bonds of community, of citizenship, of family, of intellectual tradition, of neighborhood, that bring us together. And that tradition of humanism lives and is strong in the Aspen Institute today and in the Aspen Ideas Festival. We are so proud that we are a community where people can gather, engage in conversations, truly listen to one another, talk through tough topics, find clarity around agreement and around disagreement, and sometimes make something new from the conversation that wouldn't have happened had we not put our minds together. Each of you is the inheritor with us of that tradition. We're so grateful to you for that. Civil dialogue is the heart of the Aspen Institute. It's what we stand for and believe. We think it is the greatest resource we have in a pluralistic and ever-changing world. On that note, again, thank you. And let me welcome Cesar Conde to the stage. Thank you, Cesar. Very good. Thank you so much, Dan, and thank you for your partnership throughout the years um, uh, and your entire team at the Aspen Institute. A special thank you also to Margot Pritzker um, for her leadership and friendship throughout the years and to uh, the great Tina Brown for her collaboration and her leadership during this Ideas Festival. Good afternoon, welcome. It's wonderful to have you all here today. I think the programming that this team has uh, brought to us over the last few days has brilliantly captured the issues that we as a country and a society are facing uh, most prominently right now. And it's many of the same issues that we at NBC Universal across our television, uh, digital and streaming platforms cover every single day. And both here 
at home and abroad, we are living in such consequential times. And the next few months and the developments that we see over them, uh, I think it's gonna make it even more important. So for us at NBC Universal, it is such a privilege, it's a tremendous honor to have been part, uh, not only of this Ideas Festival, but of these uh, discussions and programming over the last uh, few days. And in the spirit of the Aspen Institute tradition of bringing the best minds, the most important leaders to talk about, discuss, and provide insights about so many of these challenging issues that we face today, our hope, our objective uh, here at NBC Universal is to help amplify, help bring some of those insights, some of those conversations beyond the mountains of Aspen. And we hope to do that by utilizing our, all of our television networks, our streaming platforms, our digital platforms to reach millions of our audiences because we believe at our core it is fundamental that the knowledge, the information that we are also privileged to have here at the Ideas Festival, that it reads a broader and more diverse audience. So with that, thank you all for being here, and I think you're in for a real treat this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please don't, don't welcome me. guest curator of the 2024 Aspen Ideas Festival, Tina Brown. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, Dan and Caesar. There's been such invigorating partners to work for with in this great endeavor that is the Aspen Ideas Festival. And welcome to everyone to the 20th high-flying afternoon of conversation. At a time when everyone seems to be yelling past each other or living in bubbles patrolled by a Praetorian guard of ideologues, I was so thrilled to be asked to bring new creative thinking to one of America's premier theaters for listening to each other. Because Americans can't live together if we don't talk and exchange ideas, and we can't talk and exchange ideas if we don't live or at least rub shoulders together. And there are so many opportunities to do that at the Aspen Ideas Festival. As a lifelong magazine editor, my goal has been to present these seven days of live experience as I would an edition of Vanity Fair or of The New Yorker, corralling the most fascinating minds I know, or wanted to know, to help break open this swirling moment in modern history. At every turn, societies, professions, social norms, and political systems are being disrupted or reimagined. But even as we confront existential dangers and we are sustained by the creative thinkers and their groundbreaking ideas and their imaginative solutions who confirm our best impulses and lead us to new understanding. So this afternoon, we're gonna start with two guests and longtime friends who are turning the world on its head. Sam Altman, the boy king of artificial intelligence, and Brian Chesky, who's made travel a global homestay. These two brilliant young innovators have been friends since their days at the tech startup accelerator Y Combinator. And during the corporate upheaval at OpenAI last November, when Sam Altman was precipitously removed as CEO, it was his friend B Brian, who was one of his closest advisors during that turmoil, and saw Sam eventually returned to the top job. They're both here today to talk with NBC's distinguished nightly news anchor, Lester Holt. So let's begin. Thank you. Visionaries, disruptors, founders, friends. Two of Silicon Valley's most innovative leaders together on one stage. I hope it's not us tech leaders alone solving the future. Technology is at its best when it's inclusive. OpenAI was founded on the belief that artificial intelligence has the potential to improve nearly every aspect of our lives, but also that it creates serious risks we have to work together to manage. Sam Altman wants to revolutionize, well, everything with generative AI. How we're going to integrate this technology is, I think, one of the most important questions of our time. And then there's Brian Chesky, who revolutionized the hospitality and tourism industry and changed the way we vacation. We're a part of culture. The brand is a noun and verb used all over the world. Chesky has said it was the worst idea that ever worked. 
We design great experiences for people. It just happens to be a good business. Neither are without controversy. There are worries about Airbnb's potential to affect rents and neighborhoods. And for all of its potential, is AI a sleeping genie, an existential threat to the human race? I understand the very real cause for anxiety about the speed with which things are moving. Are we ready to go all in on these transformative platforms? Please welcome Sam Altman and Brian Chesky. get all the applause. I've invented nothing. <laughs> oh. Zippo, great to see you guys. Welcome. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Very excited about this conversation. Uh, we'll set this up by letting folks know you guys are friends. You have your, your work has kind of, you know, worked in together on some important projects and some important things. So we're going to get into some of that as well. But you're wondering why the two of them are here. That's why. Thank you so much for your time. You. Let me get, um, let's start off with kind of a perspective. Sam, what percentage of this audience do you think has in some way interacted with AI today? I, I would bet most. Uh, I'm not going to hold you to it, by the way. <laughs> in the 90s. It's a, and most of us don't know where it's affecting our lives. Yeah, you know, there, there are people who use ChatGPT, and you kind of know when you're using that or not, but the number of people that are integrating AI into all of their other services and taking our GPT-4 and other models that we have, and you know, it's sort of like lifting a lot of services up. Has AI crossed a, a critical threshold in the past year? I think that, yes, but I think there will be many thresholds that AI uh, crosses. You know, we used to, Brian actually gave me great advice about this. We used to talk about, we're gonna get to this like moment of AGI and you know, it was this very ill-defined term, and I think it never made sense to think about it that way in the first place, but we used to. And, and now we think about it as it'll just be this series of thresholds uh, where the systems will get new and new, cap better and better capabilities. So, you know, you can use ChatGPT today for some things, and you'll be able to use it for much more helpful tasks in the future. Um, you know, maybe today there are things like, okay, uh, like, for example, one of our... Um, one of our partners, Color Health, is now using uh, GPT-4 for cancer screening and treatment plans, and that's great. And then maybe a future version will help uh, discover cures for cancer. So I think of it as successive thresholds, but definitely the fact that we can talk to computers in natural language and have them understand us and help us, that's certainly been a threshold. I want to talk about some things that we've seen in the news lately and get your reaction to it. Um, at times, you have both made friends and enemies fairly quickly. You struck a big deal with Apple recently. Um, Elon Musk was upset and said he wouldn't allow Apple products at his companies. Did you see that reaction coming? Uh, well, I saw it happen, but no, I didn't. <laughs> I, I, I didn't. I sort of doubt it will actually happen, um, but I didn't predict that. Are you? Are you does it? represent something that's happening on the outskirts of open AI in terms of reaction from other tech companies? Uh, no, I think that's just like an Elon reaction. <laughs> <laughs> and Brian, let me turn to you. Airbnb recently picked up an AI startup. Are we at a point now that every tech company is going to have to have a piece of this action, a partnership or uh, its own development plans? Yeah, I mean, I think that just like now every company almost in the world is on the internet, AI is just gonna be completely embedded in everything that we do. And I think that one of the things that's incredible about Sam is like Sam used to say, you have to be, if you wanna be a great entrepreneur, you have to be right about one big thing in your career. And I think that Sam was right about one of the biggest things in the history of tech, because this is going to be something that's gonna affect people's lives more than any technology that we've ever seen in the past. But I think a lot of the conversation, you know, we're talking about AI as this like existential, enigmatic thing. And I think one of the things we're missing is just talking about the practical ways that people can benefit their lives. So I can just give you an example of Airbnb, but Sam has a lot of examples. So today, Airbnb is a way you like type in a city and you find a home and you book a home and that's Airbnb and that's pretty much the way that the internet's worked for the last 20 years. 
But imagine in the future um, systems that understand you better. That's the real promise, a computer that can understand you. They can ask you, like, well, who are you, Lester? Like, what are your hopes? What are your dreams? Like, where do you want to travel? What do you one day want to do with your life? And then it could actually understand you and be more of a matchmaker, really understand you and match you to people, communities, services, experiences, anything you want to be able to travel and live anywhere in the world. And that's kind of how I think Airbnb can use, but I think almost every industry can get remade with AI, and I think they can participate. But the stakes are higher here than, I mean, what, what you talk about is largely aspirational, but with AI, you're looking at some real fears that I think we all here understand. So what does that mean in terms of the people who are running this? Most of us are just passengers on this bus, or watching you guys you know, do these incredible things, you know, talk about it being compared to the Manhattan Project and wondering where is this going and wondering who are the people behind it? Can we trust these people? So talk, if you can, about the moral responsibility um, and, and for all of us to know these people, know people like you who are making these changes. Yeah, I mean, I, I can share. Um, I, I mean, I, I met Sam in 2008. And when I came to Silicon Valley, the word technology might as well have been like a dictionary definition for the word good. I mean, Facebook's a way to share photos of your friends. YouTube was like cat videos. Twitter was like talking about like what you're going to doing today. And I think there was this general innocence. And I think over time, what we realized is when you take a tool, and I think technology is a tool. You know, Steve Jobs, one of the things he said is he put a handle on the back of every computer because he said, never trust a computer you can't throw out the window. He said, these are tools. And we're meant to dominate them. They don't dominate us. And I think one of the things that happened, though, is when you put a tool in the hands of hundreds of millions of people, you know, they're going to use it for ways you didn't intend. And I think we are much more sober and realistic in this new generation because I think we learned a lot of the lessons of the last generation. We learned about how technology can be used mostly for good, but there's always unintended consequences. And so I think this time, one of the things I've seen Sam do is he's been very cautious, not Pollyannish at all, about where this technology is going. And in really telling governments there actually is a need for regulation. Sam, I want to get your, your take and give you a chance to talk about your firing. You were, you were fired from your own company. Why? Let me first touch on something that Brian said with your earlier question, and then I will be very happy to talk about that. Um, <laughs> I, this is going to be a huge change in society. Uh, I think unlike other technological trends, um, we're sort of, we're aware, even if today we're like, okay, ChatGPT is this like very helpful tool and it's, you know, once I use it, I'm not scared of it. Um, there is a sense of, super understandable anxiety about where this is going to go. What does it mean if these tools keep getting more capable at the rate they've been getting capable at? And there's tons of wonderful things, and we could talk about those all day, but there is this, what is the future going to look like? Even if we solve every safety problem, even if we solve every um, you know, misuse problem, even if we figure out the perfect regulatory regime, like what are, what are our lives gonna be like when it's not just like the computer understands us and gets to know us and helps us and do these things, but we can say like, hey computer, like discover all of physics. And it can go off and do that. Um, what does it mean when we can say like, hey, start and run a great company, it can go off and do that. So that's a big change. Uh, that's a lot of trust that we have to earn to be some of the stewards, there will be many other people working on this, of this technology and we're, we're proud of our track record. Uh, I think if you look at the systems that we've put out and the time and care we've taken, we've been able to get them to a level of generally accepted robustness and safety that is well beyond what, what people thought we were gonna be able to do when we got to these initial systems a few years ago. Like when you looked at GPT-2 or GPT-3 and said, are we gonna be able to make this safe enough to use? A, a lot of people thought no. But, but there's this thing, in, there's this, the future is like looming large and We've got to continue to earn the trust with what we do, the systems we put in the world, um, and how we, how we have legitimate decision making over these systems, how we broadly empower people with them, how we continue to promote stability in the world in the face of all this change. Um, and it makes people very anxious. Uh, and the whole, like, the whole board firing me and coming back thing, I mean, Brian was an enormous help during that. Uh, it was obviously a super painful experience 
but I do understand why anxiety levels have been so, are so high. Uh, I, and I think the previous board members, like, they're nervous about the continued development of AI, uh, had whatever feelings they had about me and how we were doing things, and although I super strongly disagree with what, what they think, things they've said since, how, how they acted, uh, I think they're like fundamentally good people who are nervous about the future and trying to figure out how we get to a, a good outcome. Um, I'm super excited with the new board. They're extremely uh, constructive and helpful and experienced and strong, and it's been a very productive thing since then, but that was a horrible experience to go through, not, not during the moment where it was just like, this is a crazy thing, let's figure out how to undo it, and Brian was like unbelievably helpful, but then the period after that, uh, where I just had to like kind of pick up the pieces in this like state of emotional shock, that was, that was really bad. You were trying to pick up the pieces, you were picking up the phone, Brian. Yes. Explain that. Well, I remember, um, <coughs> So maybe just to go back in time, um, when ChatGPT launched, and it launched in late, late November 2022, it was a phenomenon unlike anything we'd seen probably since the launch of the iPhone. I have no recollection of anything, and I, we knew overnight everything was gonna change. And I remember meeting with Sam, and I said, you know, I've been through a little bit of this rocket ship before, and I'm not gonna advise you on the core research of AI, but when it comes to like marketing and like stakeholder management and PR and like design and product and everything that's not that, you're gonna go on a rocket ship. And I'm only where I am today because people believed in me and people helped me. And one of the great things about Silicon Valley is a high trust place where people will help. So I just wanted to be helpful to him. So this goes on for about a year. It's one year later and I get a text message and it's actually from somebody else saying Sam was fired from OpenAI. I was like, fired? And I immediately texted him. And I think his text back to me like, was five minutes later. He had just found out he was fired. And he said, so brutal. And I go, what happened? So we get on the phone and he doesn't know what happened. It wasn't fully explained to him. And by the way, his co-founder, who was also on the board, was removed from the board. And that seemed to me very suspicious. So I got on the phone with him and Greg and I felt really comfortable with the circumstances that this was not a fair process. And I think this should always be a fair process, but especially if they're founders, because they're very, very difficult to replace. And what I noticed in those first 24 hours was not a lot of people sticking up for Sam. And I, in my darkest times, in my crisis, have had people stick up for me. And that's what I wanted to do for Sam. And I basically, we talked through things, and I said, I think the most important thing for you to do is just be completely transparent internally and externally with what you know and what's happening. But the most remarkable thing and the thing that made me really want to defend him was, you know, you, don't, you learn a lot about people in a crisis. If you really want to know what someone's like, see them in a crisis. And at no point in the five days this went down did Sam ever even for a second focus on self-preservation. He was completely... I was like, why aren't you sticking up for you? Like, why don't you care more about yourself? That's what I was saying to him. Like, somebody's got to stick up for you. You're not even sticking up for yourself. And he just was so focused on the team and what was best for the team. And I think that's what really made me, you know, so vociferously, like, focused on helping. I want to turn, Sam, if I can turn to the, some of the bad publicity you've received lately, including the dust up over the voice of Sky. One thing that could help clear up the concern over the similarity of Sky's voice to Scarlett Johansson would be to hear from the actor who you say was hired to be the voice of Sky. Is that something that you will do? Certainly if she wants to. I mean, I know she's made statements through her agent, uh, but I'm not, I don't, I don't know where, I mean, anything she wants to do would certainly be fine with us. It, the whole thing opens up certainly a larger question of what do we own? in an AI world? Uh, do we have control over our likenesses? We're seeing uh, you know, deep fake porn right now, people's you know, heads being swapped. Um, these are harmful on an individual level. How, and I know it's not unique to open AI, but how is the industry gonna respond to this? I mean, we think the industry needs to take a super strong stance on that. It is, we obviously do, uh, and there are other issues related to how this technology is being used uh, to harm people that we think the industry needs to take a very strong stance on. 
Um, we try to be not only very loud in our calls for regulation to prevent some of these misuse cases, th these misuses, which I think is happening, but also to set a really good example in the products and services we offer and hold ourselves to a very high level. But were these things inevitable? I mean, you, you clearly saw the risk coming as this uh, technology was maturing. Like deep fakes and stuff? Deep fakes, yeah, head face swapping. Yeah. Um, it was inevitable that the technology was going to be capable of that, and, and so, it, you know, of course, there are going to be systems out there that allow that. Uh, but that's where I think we, society, and governments have a role to say, you know, we'll allow some use cases of technology we're not comfortable with, but in some places we are going to draw a line. And face swapping, deep fake revenge porn is a great place to draw a line. We're nearing a presidential election, as you know. We're seeing some of the deep fakes already happening. There's been talk about this for years, that this would be a very difficult election. What are your thoughts as you begin to see this stuff cut to emerge and in terms of your responsibility, your industry's responsibility, to make sure that we're not being overwhelmed by disinformation? Yes. Yeah, so you know, this will be, I think, the first election where th there's not just the US, many other elections this year where AI is like a major technological element. Provenance is really important. Accurate polling information and avoiding some of the issues we've seen with uh, previous technological platforms and other election cycles. Um, and, you know, preventing things like deep fakes. I, I think those are three top of mind issues for us uh, in this election cycle. I'll also add that there may be other things, ways people try to misuse, misuse this that we're not aware of yet. Um, so we're, we have like a whole monitoring efforts set up and uh, I think we'll need a very tight feedback loop as we get closer to the election uh, to see if there's additional areas where people are trying to abuse the technology. And while we're on the topic of the election, Brian, I'll let you start. What, what do you think will be the impact on your individual businesses in terms of the outcome of this election? Hard to say, I mean, Airbnb is kind of more of a city by city, state by state thing, so the changes in um, federal administrations don't, have not historically um, had a huge impact on us. And we're, of course, in a 109, 220 countries, so we're a pretty resilient business. I mean, one of the things we saw during the pandemic is when one part of our business changes, it adapts to some other part. So I don't anticipate a really big change based on who's, who's, who's elected. How about you, Sam? I do expect some big impact based off of who's elected, but I don't know how to, I, I don't know what it'll be. It, it does seem to me like AI is gonna be an increasingly important geopolitical priority in the world. Um, but I'm, you know, I, I, hard for me to say exactly how it's going to go. One of the things that I've really valued about Brian, so Brian kind of like uh, undersold what he mentioned earlier in that first year, kind of like what he's done to help, but when ChatGPT started taking off and everything just went crazy for me, a lot of people reach out and say, oh, I'd love to help you, I can do this, I can do that. And you know, everyone's, I think they mean it when they say it, but everybody's just busy. Um, Brian was like the person who would just sit down with me for like three hours every other week and like give me a list and say, here's the five things you gotta do now, here's where you're behind, here's what you're screwing up, here's what you gotta proactively do, here's what you gotta think about. Um, and it's basically like almost always right and uh, I learned to just like take that. always shut up and follow the advice. Um, one of the things that Brian started saying uh, more recently uh, is that you're probably not thinking enough about politics and policy and what that's going to mean for how the world thinks about AI. And here's the people you need to hire. Here's the here's what it means to like you know, map this out and think about a strategy here. Here's what you should do and definitely not do. And uh, that's been like super helpful. And I do think for our business, it's gonna be really important. And I think one of the things, Lester, is that, you know, I remember coming to Silicon Valley, we didn't think these platforms would have the impact on society that they, we now know they have. And so I think the mindset that Sam has, and even the questions you're asking him, probably weren't asked of tech leaders 15 years ago. I think the whole industry has changed the whole conversation is, is like, like Sam has built out much more of a team much earlier than the big tech companies would have around policy and stakeholder management. I want to ask about one of the things we've learned in your research in developing ChatGPT and others is the requirement of data 
to train up these modules. It's an insatiable appetite as it, as it appears. Has it changed how you view what is fair use and whose material, copyrighted material you can use? First of all, I don't think we know yet what the future of how these models get smart is going to look like. You know, is it that we just need more and more data forever? It doesn't feel to me like likely to be right. You know, if you think about what a human can learn from reading one textbook, it's very different than what it takes these AI models for now. So I, I expect, and also there comes a point where to like invent new science, you need to just sit there and think and run some experiments, but it's not in any textbook because it's new. So I, I expect that the future of how we think about training data um, and what it takes to make these models really capable. Is it gonna be a roadblock though in the development of these products? That's what I was trying to say. I, I, you know, this is like science, we don't know for sure. I think it won't be. Um, now, that said, uh, the issue of like fair use and how to think about how people who create data, create knowledge, create you know, wonderful books, I think although like from a legal perspective we're confident in our fair use per position, now that we see where this may evolve, um, we need to figure out new economic models where the whole world gets to participate. And I think this goes beyond just people who have data that we train on, but also, uh, and we've you know, found many different ways to license it and do different things, but also the people that provide the feedback to the models, the people who like go off and create great real-time news that maybe the model doesn't train on, but you wanna display it um, at the time, and that, there's a lot of work that goes into that. Uh, and you know, I, I think maybe AI is gonna, not super significantly, but somewhat significantly, change the way people use the internet. And if so, you can see some of the economic models of the past need to evolve. Uh, and I think that's a broader conversation than just training data, but it's sort of like content in general surfaced via AI. I wanna ask you about artificial general intelligence. That's taking it up, to, taking up the game considerably. If I understand it correctly, that's when you get to the point that the computers can do whatever we can do. Is that a fair summation? You know that, I, I, I think I was wrong to initially think about it as this one moment as we talked yeah. about, but uh, it does seem to me, and now I think people use AGI to mean all, all, all sorts of things. It, it does seem to me that trying to sort of roadmap out for the world where we think the significant increases in capability will be, um, can do what you know people can do, can create new science, can do what whole companies can do. Uh, that feels like it'd be very useful for the industry to sort of agree on so that we could have these conversations in a little bit more of a disciplined way. And that's one of the things we talked about is like, just operating transparently letting people know that it's probably not this one Promethean moment where it goes from AI to AGI. That there's many, many steps, just like the story of technology. And that it's really important that we bring society along. And that we're not operating in this black box and people think there's only a few people controlling the future. That we're transparent with other developers and computer scientists and researchers and policymakers about these are steps we're going, this is what we're seeing, and this is what we think the next four steps look like. But isn't, but isn't this a race on a different level? The stakes are so high. Of course. I mean, are, are you, do you consider yourself in a race and do you think it's one you'll win to get to the, the point of artificial general intelligence? I don't think of it as a race. I understand why that's like a very compelling, dramatic way to, to talk about it. I, I think that there may be a race between nation states um, at some point, but the companies that are developing this now, I think everyone feels the stakes, the need to get this right. I also think to, to Brian's point that it's not, there's not this milestone we're all racing towards. It is this, it is this continual evolution of technology where we melted sand and figured out how to like turn it into transistors and then figured out how to like build an operating system and do a certain kind of programming and we made it bigger and bigger and then we figured out how to like train these systems that are sort of smart in some ways but they're not off like running as these autonomous things they're tools that we're using to do more than we could before in the way that we use computers to do more than we could before without ai and in the way we used machines in the industrial revolution to do more than we could before and in the way we used agriculture to be able to have time and space to do more things than we could before. And, and I don't think it's this race to a milestone, it's this ongoing, 
the next step and the next one and the next one, and the tools are gonna get better and better. But what happens is it's not, like for sure technology is not neutral and tools are not inherently neutral things, but the impact we can have by building the tools is important, we wanna get that right. That people are gonna go use these tools to invent the future that we all collectively live in. And what one person can already do now before ChatGPT existed is an impressive leap. And by the time we get to GPT-6 or 7, what one person can do will be incredibly uh, increased. And I'm very excited for that. Like, I think that is, that is the story of the world getting better. We make technology, um, people use it to build new things, express their creative ideas, and society improves. Yeah, when you, when you talk about these programs, though, um, and when you give them the ability to do what we do, we also have a set of values, different sets of values. We view common decency in a not so common way sometimes. How do you teach that to a computer in a way that won't be harmful? How do you teach values that are positive? One of the things that has surprised me, and I don't wanna say this gets us like, this solves the whole AI alignment problem, um, but at our current levels of systems, uh, our ability to teach a model a certain set of values and to behave in a certain way um, is way better than I thought it was gonna be at this point. Now there's a harder question, which is who gets to decide what those values are? Um, who gets to decide what the defaults are? How much an individual user can uh, sort of customize them within those broad bounds? And as an early step there, we put out this thing maybe a month or two ago called the spec, where we tried to say, um, here is our desired model behavior. Here are the values we want our model to follow. And that way people can at least tell if it's a bug or intentional when it does something that they don't like. And over time, society can debate what those values are and we can adapt to it. Um, so I'm very heartened by our technical progress on this topic, but man, writing that set of values or getting society to debate and agree on what those set of values should be, that's a much harder challenge. Hey Brian, you, as you've talked about, you've given Sam um, advice from time to time. I, I, I read somewhere, I don't have the exact quote in front of me, at least I can't find it right now, but to, the, the notion of go for it and figure it out later. Uh, I don't know what is the quote? It's the, it. it's, it's the idea that you, you have believed that you need to go for it when it comes to this kind of research. Are there breaks that should be put on? Well, yeah, I mean, I think if you imagine you're in a car, the faster the car goes, the more you need to look ahead in front of you and you need to anticipate the corners. And I think that we acknowledge that this technology is so, so powerful that I think this is why we're like being so thoughtful. I mean, people really are agonizing over how to treat these systems. And I do not remember us doing this in 2007, 2008. So I do think it's a very, very different time. I mean, one of the things that like, Sam and I talked about was bring other stakeholders in early. And one of the things we did last year is we went on a tour around the world meeting with people. It was mostly, I think, a way to get feedback from people, educate people, and really get feedback. So I think, I think the key point, Lester, is we never go so fast that we leave society behind. That we only go as fast as to bring everyone along. And I think that if everyone here could feel like they could participate and they could have their input into it, then I don't really think there's a huge thing to fear. I think the thing to fear is something we don't understand or we're left out of, and something that runs away from us that we can't control. And so that's the future we don't want to live in. Also, it's quite interesting, if you say the word AI, it can be scary. You say ChatGPT, it doesn't sound as scary because it's a very tangible tool. So I think we need to also just focus on like that which is in front of us and how can we help people. There's a lot of problems right now. And open AI, I mean, it can lead to a lot of scientific research and discovery. Um, ChatGPT can be an incredible tool for artists. Um, you know, with Airbnb, we, can think, we think it can really bring people together. We're living in this huge epidemic of loneliness. We can use this to help bring people together. At the end of the day, it's not the technology, it's the people with the technology. It always comes down to the people, their values, and are they good people? The, the way I sort of think about this is um, we need to learn how to make safe technology. We need to figure out how to build safe products, and that, in, in, that includes like an ongoing dialogue with society about hey, this has this impact I didn't expect or don't want, and also you're not letting me do this thing that's really important for this reason you didn't understand. So the way that we talk to the broader world and the people that use and impact by our products and impacted by our products and let, let them reflect what they want. And then also like a safe operating plan, which is we get better and better at predicting capabilities, 
Um, research is, of course, an open question. You don't always know where it's going to go, but before we start training a new model, we'd like to be able to say, here, here are the dangerous capabilities that we think could happen. We have a preparedness framework to test them. Sometimes this takes a very long time. Uh, with GPT-4, for example, we had about eight months between when we finished training and when we released it, including lots of like external consultation and red teaming. Um, future models may take even longer, but it is very important to get the feedback from society. One thing that I don't think is good is to let a huge capability overhang build up. Uh, and then we haven't had that feedback loop with society. So we, 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 we do need to figure out how to balance that. But yeah, you know, taking the time to get it right is very important. Are you ever inclined, or do you think you'd ever be inclined to back up, to see the future and, in a, and find it is maybe as scary as some, some people have suggested? Are you prepared to that, hit that moment where you have to take a step back, even as your competitors may want to move forward? For sure. Um, there are things that we have built and chosen not to release or held back for long periods of time. Um, there are plenty of other companies that would release things that we won't. Um, we're not going to get every decision right, of course, and uh, we also may at some point deploy something and need to take it back, but there will also be things that we just don't deploy. You, you know, we talk about these scary images. Did it help when you compared where you are with AI with the Manhattan Project, the, the race to build an atomic weapon. Was that helpful for you as you try to make your case? I mean, we, we try to give a number of historical analogies because we think it is important. We may be wrong, we may be right, but it's important for us to tell society what we believe the level of importance of this technology is. There's no perfect historical analog for any new technology. So we can say there were some things about the Manhattan Project that are like what we're doing now. There's some things about the Apollo program. There are some things about the iPhone. There are some things about that iMac with the handle, which I also really loved. Um, there are some things about the internet. There are some things about the Industrial Revolution. And, but what I think is important is to say, here are the parts where we can look to a historical analogy, and here are the parts where we can't. And the shape of this technology and kind of the decisions and the impact it is fundamentally like a little bit different than anything I think we've I think it's before. different than the Manhattan Project. It's not a race. It's not going to be done in secret. And I think nations can collaborate together, and there could be a transnational kind of group or body that could really kind of align to make sure we're all on the same page, which would be best for society and, frankly, probably best for entrepreneurs so they don't have to comply with like 200 different laws. We think, we think that's super important uh, to, get, to yeah. get some sort of global framework and cooperation uh, I think we're, all, we're really going to need that. I think one of you mentioned the, the, the nation states. Is there a risk of, of nation states taking this technology and using them in a, in a dangerous way? Or Absolutely. And um, I, you know, I think you always have to be really, really careful about like, who this technology, who, who you're putting this technology in the hands of. And I think it goes back to like, some of the things Sam's thinking about. Like, one of the things we, like, I know they developed early on that they chose not to release is like, voice cloning, right? There's technology already where you can basically like, capture someone's voice, but obviously that would be very, very dangerous because obviously you can imagine how it could compromise elections and major c security risk. So I think one of the things is just thinking about like, who could these tools end up in the hands of, and therefore, if you let the genie out of the bottle, could it get like too dangerous? And so be very thoughtful about it. And Sam, according to one report, you speculated artif artificial in general intelligence could accrue as much wealth as $100 trillion. That's wealth that you said you would then redistribute. Is that, was that an accurate quote? And do you want to expand on it? I, I think the sort of point I was trying to make was that I thought it could like double the world's GDP, um, which feels like reasonable to me and certainly would be in line with other technological revolutions. Mm. Um, yeah, we do think this is just going to be a massive driver of productivity. And already at this early stage, seeing what people are doing with it to sort of vastly improve products and services. Do you, th you, do you understand how that would sound to a lot of people, though? <laughs> um, for, for, for sure, of course. Uh, I, but I think like this is where this is where historical analogs are helpful. And this is where it is helpful to look at the chart of world GDP over time. And you know, if the, if the world GDP can grow at you know, 7% a year, like, which sounds hugely fast, but maybe with a technological shift like this um, is not 
that far away. I'm always bad at doing this in my head, but I think that's like only 10 years to double. So I, I think it is, you know, I think it is worth taking the potential of this technology to do enormous good very seriously. And I think we can now see more of what that looks like as people are adopting the tools. Preview, if you will, for us, ChatGPT5. Um, what, what will the leaps in technology be, and, and does it put you on a straighter path to where you want to be? Does it put us on a what path? I'm sorry? A what path? Uh, does it put you on a straighter path straight. in terms of your goals? Um, so we don't know yet. Uh, you know, we're, we're optimistic, but we still have a lot of work to do on it. Uh, but I expect it to be a significant leap forward. Um, a lot of the things that GPT-4 gets wrong, you know, can't do much in the way of reasoning, sometimes just sort of totally goes off the rails and like makes a dumb mistake, uh, like even like a six-year-old would never make. Um, I expect it to be much, much better in those ways and to be able to be used for a much wider variety of, of more helpful tasks. And it does go off the rails sometimes. Is that a result to back where we were, we were speaking about the lack of data or the shortage of data? I think it's many things together. It's, we're, we're, we're still just like so early in developing such a complex system. Um, there's data issues, there's algorithmic issues. Uh, the models are still quite small relative to what they will be someday and we know they get predictably better. Uh, so I think it's more like there's many things that we need to go improve all of and we're still just like so early in the technology. You know, the first iPhone was still pretty buggy, but it was like good enough to be useful for people. Yeah, I think that like, I, I don't think things are gonna change as much in the world in the next couple of years as people think. It's not linear, it's things are gonna change slowly and then probably all of a sudden. And I think everyone's still trying to figure out how to use this technology. If you take your phone and you look at your home screen and ask yourself a year and a half after ChatGPT launched, how many apps are fundamentally different because of AI? And very few of them are fundamentally different. So I think we're still in this world where we're developing a lot of the, you know, computation with NVIDIA. Sam and team are developing the models. And a lot of the change in size can happen when people build on top of those models, the applications. And there's so many uses for it. I mean, you know, one of the big use cases that we're talking about is scientific discovery. You know, think about what this can do to drug research, uh, to like, you know, some of the biggest kind of uh, types of Ill ills in society. There's a lot this can do with education. We think this can essentially give access to tutors to everyone around the world. Um, creative people. I know there's a lot of fear that artists can be replaced, but you know, I think if artists participate, I went to design school, I think this is a technology that they can use. So I think we can go down the list, um, and I think there are going to be a lot of really exciting opportunities in the next three to five years. Where do you want to be in five years, Sam? Further along this same path. You know, we'd like to... One of the most fun parts of the job is getting like tons of email every day from people who are using tools in these amazing ways. I, you know, was able to like diagnose this health problem that I'd had for years and I couldn't figure it out and was making my life miserable and I just typed my symptoms into ChatGPT and I got this idea and went to see a doctor and now I'm totally cured. Or I've been trying my whole life to learn these things and couldn't do it and I got ChatGPT to be like a tutor for me. Or I, you know, I'm like three times as productive as a developer and I'm doing these amazing things and I'm the scientist using it. And I love getting those things. I love how much people love ChatGPT. I really do. And five years from now, I just hope it's a lot more of that. I hope we have put this tool into the world that continues to delight people and let them do more and like be their best at whatever they're doing. Well, we'll be having more conversations like this down the road, certainly as you go down your path. But I want to thank both of you, uh, Sam Altman and Brian Chesky, for taking time and being with us here in Aspen. Thank you. Great conversation. Thank guys. you. Nice thank job. You. the U.S. Surgeon General says loneliness is an epidemic. And almost like someone turned a switch in 2013, girls in America and many other countries suddenly become very anxious, depressed, and self-harming.
if New York's powerful Democrats hate your politics, well, a prison cell might well be in your future. There were no riots. There hasn't even been a good-sized pro-Trump protest anywhere in years. The system, as is the Okay, get off your chat GPT and listen to us. Um, so earlier in the week, uh, Adam and I did a panel on happiness, <laughs> and now we're doing a panel on all the world's problems and existential <laughs> despair. Uh, and so after the panel, you all have a choice. Uh, in, the Aspen Institute has kindly arranged buses. If you want to, when you reach that level of total despair, you can go up a mountaintop and throw yourself off. Uh, or you can go to a Michelin star restaurant in Aspen, Colorado. Um, so what my goal here is to get us to talk about this complex vortex and to try to ar arrive at some level of greater clarity of like, what's the big picture here? What's actually going on? What's driving all this? Adam, I'll start with, well, actually I should introduce you folks. <laughs> Sherilyn Eiffel, right to my uh, left, t is the Vernon Jordan Junior Professor of Law at Howard University. Before that, <laughs> before that, she was head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and has been named one of the 100 most influential people in the world, America, the universe, some large group of wow. people. She's in the top 100. <laughs> Adam Gopnik is a staff writer at The New Yorker, has won three National Magazine Awards, uh, and he's written some great books, Paris to the Moon, A Thousand Small Sanities, and his new book is called All That Happiness Is, about accomplishment. Kara Swisher is probably the most prominent tech journalist in America. Uh, she has her famous podcast on with Kara Swisher, uh, and she had a book come out maybe six, eight months ago called Burn Book, uh, Tech Love Story. And then at the far end is Mike, it's here for Kara. <laughs> Runs Grassroots Lab, which is a premier consulting group in California. He was political director of the California Republican Party. Uh, he is co-founder of the Lincoln Project and has also has a new book out called The Latino Century. So, pretty good panel. So Adam, we'll start with you. Uh, Terrific. We've got climate change, polar polarization, a border. What the hell's going on? Well, as some of you may know who have been coming to these sessions, I started off on the far right of the repatriation <laughs> session. Then I was moved to the far left for the happiness session. And now they've put me in the squishy center where I doubtless belong most. Let me try and answer your question, David, in, with two big picture takes and then a small picture take. And the small picture take may be more important than the big picture takes. The biggest of the big picture takes on the crisis we're living through is that liberal democracies, open societies, if you like, call them what you will, depend on free and fair elections, on the rule of law, certainly. But even more, they depend on the foundation of liberal institutions, of things like schools and parks, universities, libraries, glee clubs. Um, my favorite example of a powerful liberal institution that doesn't look powerful is the coffee house. The story of the emancipation of humankind from oppression is tied to the existence of coffee houses throughout Europe and America in the 18th centuries as gathering places where people could come and have free conversations outside of the control of the state. They didn't even have to be political conversations. They could simply be the act of conversation itself was emancipating. And it's no accident that in Iran today, um, uh, the religious police go about the business of shutting down coffee houses exactly because they understand the potential of liberal institutions to create freer societies. It's apparent, I think, that liberal institutions are weakened, are under assault, are uh, as not as resilient as we want them to be, and that, I think, is the first big picture part of the problem. The internet, which um, everyone expected or dreamt of being the world's biggest coffee house, has turned out to be something more like the worst boys' bathroom in the most <laughs> bullying high school in, in the world. That's the first big picture problem as I see it. 
The second one is obviously more narrowly political, and that is the wave of far right wing, call it what you will, populism, nativism, that swept through the entire uh, North American and European worlds. We just had the Euro elections in my second adopted country of France, and we have far right party uh, threatening to come, uh, to come to power there. And what's striking about that wave that has struck so many shores, including our own, is how uniform it is in its composition. And it isn't, as best we can understand it, a struggle of the dispossessed against the, uh, uh, the privileged so much as it is a persistent struggle in France, in Britain during Brexit, and in America, and even in my native land of Canada, where politics never seem to happen. It's beginning to happen now. Uh, and that is of rural against urban, the old against the young, and above all, those with diplomas against those without. And it's remarkably consistent, those patterns in all of those otherwise very different countries. Those, I think, are the two big picture crises that we face, the crisis of liberal institutions, learning how to um, confront and deal with and uh, uh, understand that right-wing nativist impulse. But finally, there is the little picture, the little window that I want to come to um, at the risk of being somewhat pugnacious. Anne Applebaum, the great uh, historian of the Gulag Archipelago, hardly a woke activist, the farthest thing from it, said on the night of the Euro elections, there is not a single far-right leader in all of Europe who has ever rejected the results of an election. Not a single one, not Le Pen in France, not in Germany, nowhere has that happened. No country has the idea that a free and fair election should be rejected and that the peaceful transfer of power should be occluded. That has only happened in one country, and that is our own. And it's, it, we are in a moment of absolute urgency as a consequence to recognize the scale of that threat to, the, uh, to democracy itself. And if we don't confront that little picture threat with every breath in our bodies, we will not be in any position to begin to remedy the larger picture. Okay. Kara, okay. let's go to you next. I don't what the quite, hell's going on? I don't quite know what to say, <laughs> uh, except the boys' bathroom is a good now. <laughs> I hadn't thought of it, and I appreciate it. I love how you looked at me when you're like, the internet, <laughs> like I was in charge of it. Um, <laughs> no, you are, I, I defer to your expertise. Oh, upon well, it. I've been doing my level best to warn you. Um, Indeed. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a historian. I, I've, been, I've been a technology reporter, and I think it's fair to say the thing that's changed in the last many years, two decades pretty much since I started covering it in the 1990s, has been the advent of the Internet, which we all thought would bring people together in a form of community. Um, but the way it's been designed, every, you know, Brian was just on, he's a designer. The way things are designed are the way things tend to go. And I think the internet was thought of as something that could bring people together, and there are these grand ideas of bringing everybody together, and that how it would show us that, you know, someone here has the same problems as Russia, has the same problems as somewhere else. And what it's done, because of the profit motives behind it, is to separate us rather significantly because it's in shareholders' interest to keep us engaged. And the thing that keeps us engaged is enragement. So en enragement equals engagement, which I talked about earlier. And, and, and it's become such a for-profit motive that it's almost imp excuse me, impossible for it not to go that way. So I don't particularly blame the tech companies, but these are multi-trillion dollar, the most, val the most valuable companies in the history of the Earth owned by the people that are the richest people on the planet ever. And this is counting Cleopatra, who was pretty <laughs> rich from what I understand. Um, and so you have a, you have a situation where the, 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 the very small elite group of people have created themselves as kings and potentates and have, but are making decisions that the rest of society has to pay for. And so, um, you know, when the internet started, I've used this example quite a lot on my uh, book tour, um, I, I was always trying to warn people, although I love technology, um, there was a Twilight Zone episode um, called To Serve Man, um, <laughs> yes. and these aliens came down, they solved every problem that people had in society. There was, they have the big head that we like to put on aliens, 
Why do we do that, I wonder? Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think they'd have small heads, but, or no heads at all. Um, but so they, um, so they came down, they solved the problem, and they left behind a book, and we were trying to translate it. Human, humanity was, and we could only translate the cover, which was to serve Super man, and everyone was like, oh, yay, they're here to help yeah. us. <laughs> and at the, of course, I'm not going to ruin the plot, but it's a, if you haven't seen it by now, too bad. Um, it's like do 100, it, it. it's 100 years old at this point. So I'm sorry you didn't catch up to Bridgerton. I won't tell you the end of that one. <laughs> but Penelope Featherington for the win. Um, so um, she's so great. Um, but it's a, it's a cookbook, right? It's a cookbook. And it's something I've been trying to say. It's a cookbook. And you all are the ingredients of what it is. And so until we start to figure out a way to make that community better, because it's the way everything's going in the future, and Sam and Brian were just talking about it, with these technologies that are ever more powerful, unless we figure out a way for all of us to be part of it and not the ingredients, I think it's a really worrisome situation. And it's no mistake that the single greatest user of the internet in the political age is Donald Trump. Um, he's an expert. You may not like him, but he's quite good at, at internet. Um, at enragement. And enragement. Um, and he's perfectly tailored the way Franklin Roosevelt with, with radio or John F. Kennedy with television um, to use this. And at some point, someone was going to come along who was, who was a bad actor to start to use and abuse these ever powerful technologies. And that's where we are now. But it does not have to be that way. And I can talk about that more okay. later. Because on some level, there's a lot of catastrophizing of everything. Mm -hmm. right. And you know, it's, people are sort of like, ah! Like, I don't know why the, you know, this idea that they're going to inevitably win is, I think, is not true. Because they haven't over the history of time. The Salem witch trials, everything else, they just haven't. And for us to sit around and go, oh, no, it's the end times, to me, is sort of, Anyone who's, I, I'm a gay person, anyone who's a person of color who's a woman knows they're always after us. So everybody else, and I'm talking largely men, get on fucking board. We know they're after <laughs> us. So that was what I would say. Okay. Feeling bellicose already. Sherilyn. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Kara, that was a great setup. Thank you. Um, <laughs> take it, take it home. Yeah, take it home. So this is American vortex, and I, I so I only feel equipped to speak about a country that I have uh, studied and and feel quite familiar with. You know, I think in our country we are so um, disengaged from the truth of our history, from the truth of what it took to build this room, to have all of us be in this room and be able to be in this room to have some people in this room be married to who they're married to, to have people be able to purchase homes in the places where some of you have been able to purchase homes, or go to schools where some of you have been able to go to schools. We treat that like it's air. We treat it like it was always this way, even though many of you in this room are old enough to remember when it was not so. Everyone didn't have access to the coffee house either. And so when um, we come upon moments of um, um, innovation or moments of crisis, and we forget that history. We forget that what we have managed to stitch together has been um, powerfully fought for in the courts, in the streets, um, everywhere. Then we fall into a situation in which we are creating things with a blank slate. Internet is the perfect example. I had many conversations with Sheryl Sandberg and Mark Zuckerberg in 2019 and 2020, and I would hear this conversation about creating this public square where everyone could speak. And what I would say to Sheryl and Mark is, you have not evidence that you have any <clears throat> understanding of how the public square and access to the public square was negotiated in this country. The public square is not just a place you walk up into. We had to have a Civil Rights Act of 1964 to ensure that I could go to the bathroom in the public square, that I could go to the coffee shop in the public square, or in the airport. So if you don't know that history, then you treat these things that arise on the platform as utter surprises. Who could have imagined that there would be campaigns that would target racial or religious groups? Who could have imagined Gamergate? Who could have imagined all of this stuff when our history is all there ready to tell you? 
what, unless we decide to be proactive, will happen. And hearing the conversation about AI just um, before this panel is the same thing. So when we enter this bold new world, who are the people sitting at the table and what knowledge do they have about the truth of this country, about what lives in our DNA, about what have been the hardest issues that we have grappled with and been unable to overcome, about our finest moments, which have involved us being able to confront those very difficult issues like racism and white supremacy, mm -hmm. and contain them and figure out how to protect people and figure out how to ensure the dignity of all people. If you're not operating with that as the framework of something vital to know about this country, then the idea that you are so genius and such an innovator that the government should not regulate what you do because you're so smart is gross mismanagement of public policy and utterly irresponsible. The faster the car, you know, Sam talked about the faster the car uh, and how you have to, you know, peer into the, in, or maybe Brian said it, and you have to look more closely ahead. No, actually what you had to do was that a very unpopular law requiring seat belts had to be passed in this country. And if many of you will remember during that period, um, there were car manufacturers who said, this is interfering with the design and the innovation of our vehicles. And the liberty of... And the liberty of people getting in them. My father was one of them. When he, <laughs> when, when, so I'm the youngest of 10 children. When I was very young, one of my earliest memories is getting into our Buick and taking my seat, which was on the floor behind the driver. <laughs> Later on, when some of my older siblings moved away, and my father was able to get a Cadillac, his dream. Then we sat, there were six of us, and there were three in the back and three in the front. Now we have a seatbelt law. And it's, you can't stuff as many people into the car as you want to stuff into the car. And my father said, this is discrimination. It's outrageous. I don't want to wear this seatbelt. And it was only after getting pulled over and getting tickets that he had to wear the seatbelt, <laughs> right? Now, was that some gross intrusion on his civil liberties or on his rights? No, an assessment was made by government about highway deaths, about what could prevent highway deaths, and those innovative manufacturers who made these beautiful cars were compelled to put in something that would protect the American public. Right. That's what has to happen with the internet. And the last thing I'll just say is, the last thing I'll say is that what truly ails us, David, is our um, willingness to withdraw from public life. Healthy democracies have a strong public life. They have public universities. They have strong public schools. They have a public square where people can engage. And because the Supreme Court in 1954 in Brown versus Board of Education and in the cases that flow from it, made clear now that everything public would have to be shared on an equal basis with black people, far too many white people in this country demonized that which is public. If I say public schools to you, you have an image in your head of who's in those schools. If I say public transportation, when we have these wars about should we pay for highways or public transportation, there is a racial patina over that conversation. We have withdrawn from working towards the public good because far too many people believe that when we talk about the public good, we're talking about giving free things to black people. Mm -hmm. So, one of the tasks before us is figuring out how to confront that reality and get our country re-engaged in caring not just about our own children, but caring about other people's children as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Mike, uh, you've been through a couple of revolutions, I would say. One, the evolution of the Republican Party. Yeah. Nice job with that. <laughs> uh, and, 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 but also your, your book, The Latino Century, the, the immigration of various Latino groups to this country and what they've accomplished in this country is also quite a revolutionary thing. How do you see the big picture? I think, first of all, the, this crisis in our institutions has become a defining feature of the digital age. Right? The digital age for people of my age was always something that was coming, that was coming. We're, we're eyeballs deep in this thing. And what we're realizing is a lot of the social constructs that we created to make liberal democracy work, and frankly, society in general work, aren't, aren't working. And it's pretty broad-based. 
and its collapse is part of the fear and anxiety and concern that we have because we're barreling down a road into a future that none of us, frankly, as a species, have ever really endured before. We can't seem to find common ground or find the trust and confidence in, our, in institutions to make things work. One of the things that I find particularly interesting is that it's most pronounced with voters that are 65 years of age and over, nobody in this room, of course, <laughs> but that, that, that cohort has one of the most negative views of America mm -hmm. and where we're at and its future, despite having a lifetime of relative mm -hmm. prosperity and mm -hmm. peace and to a certain extent, global hegemony in the United States. But one of the biggest disruptions that's happening in our, in our society, or at least in our American society, and I think it's also true of Western Europe, is this dramatic transformation of our complexion. We will be in eight years, eight short years, America will be a non-white majority country for the first time in our history. That's gonna change so much about how we perceive the world, how we perceive ourselves, and how we engage with these institutions. And one of the most promising demographics, who wrote a book about it, is that this Latinization of America, this, this transformation ethnically and racially that is happening is overwhelmingly with Latinos and the Latino population. Exponential growth rates are starting to happen right now. We're seeing at the voting booth. This is the one group of Americans that have, by a wide measure, the greatest trust and confidence in our institutions broadly. And our negative perceptions of our institutions have gotten so bad in this country that we've actually partisanized them. And we no longer believe that maybe they're in need of reform or they need to be fixed or need to be invested in. If we don't agree with them, we think that they need to be destroyed or that they are trying to destroy us. So the right will say, the academy, the media, the government, you know, is, is out to get them. And the left will say things like the church, the military, sometimes corporations are out to get them. And it's better to kind of just get rid of them almost than it's entirely or neuter them if we're going to go forward with our zero-sum vision of the world. But, and this is what I want you all to think about, what we are becoming as a country, demographically, our DNA, that is emerging is actually where the solutions to this cultural crisis is. This belief in who we are, this hope in the American experiment, that's what makes America move forward. That's what always has moved us forward. And that mythology is being brought forward more pronounced by a younger, poorer, blacker and browner generation despite having less reasons to believe in it. Mm. And it's why ultimately I'm optimistic despite all the calamity, all the fragility, all the worry about the underpinnings of democracy coming spinning off of its axles, our solutions literally are inside of us. And every day, every day in America we wake up and we're still here, demographically I think we are closer to becoming not just alive and existing, but actually a better model for what our original promise was intended to be. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll try to pivot, pivot us to more hopeful progress, and I'll ask for shorter questions so we can get through at least maybe two more rounds in the 10 minutes we have remaining. Now, I, a couple of years ago, I read a book called The Politics of Disharmony by a guy named Samuel Huntington. And he wrote the book in 1981, and he said, you know, I noticed this weird pattern in American history. Every 60 years, we tend to go through what he called a moral convulsion. And that's people get disgusted with established power, um, a new passionate generation comes on the scene, a new form of communications technology, groups that have been excluded demand inclusion. He said this happened in the 1770s, happened in the 1830s with the age of Jackson, the 1890s and the Industrial Revolution, the 1960s. And writing in 1981, he wrote, I don't know if this pattern holds, but if it does, sometime around 2020, America will go through another moral convulsion. <laughs> so I thought, pretty good. But the hopefulness is we come out of them. We have a period where we have to reform and we do reform. And Sherilyn, I'll start with you. And again, if we could keep, yeah. the, keep, but, it, brief. keep it shorter. But um, there was an implied story of progress in your last answer. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, point, absolutely. point us forward. Absolutely. I mean, so I do not 
count this country as a democracy until at least 1954, because yeah. half of the country was under legal apartheid, and so that's not a democracy. Um, some would say 1965, when the Voting Rights Act was passed, but certainly 1954. And I, I, I what I believe is that we are a very young democracy, at least a, a multiracial democracy, that actually is trying to do it the right way. And so I tend to be a little bit more patient with this country because I only see us as being quite young and quite, um, frankly, unused to what probably most of us have come to accept as what American life is like, but which is, in fact, actually very new. What is exciting for me about this moment, I am as fearful as the next person about calamity, about democratic unraveling, because even though I believe ultimately the end will work itself out, many people can be hurt in the interim. And we should not make a small thing of that simply by knowing that we're going somewhere that may be positive. But what is great about each iteration of, if, if it's this every 60 year convulsion, is that we have the opportunity to create a better country. I've been, as you know, and talked about the other day, focused on the 14th Amendment and the post-Civil War period. We actually have the power to remake our country and to make our democracy healthier. We have the power to decide what our national identity is going to be. In the post-Civil War period, uh, we moved this idea of equality and justice into the center of the national identity, which prior to that had just been about liberty and freedom. And we have that power to do that. My concern is that if people are so discouraged and so unbelieving in our future, that they won't pick up the weights that we need to pick up in our hands to lift above our heads and work. This is a period where we are called to intensely work. It would be wonderful if we were all alive during the harvest and the wonderful times uh, when we could see our country moving forward. But what if this is the planting time? What, is th what if this is the time when we are supposed to embed what will create this new America that will be, a better, will, will be better than the one in the past? That's how I'm conceiving of this okay. moment, and, and I'm inviting others to see it that way as well. Okay, I'm sort of inspired by that planting, you know, um, by that planting moment metaphor. That's a beautiful encapsulation. But I'm gonna ask the same question maybe in a more personal way for the, uh, the remaining three, and that's, what is history demanding of you personally? Like, you're in this moment, what's the, what's the mission that, given your resources, given whatever you have, what's your personal mission in this moment to make a difference? Um, to protect and defend liberal institutions wherever we can encounter them and wherever they are endangered. Um, I think Sherilyn's point is absolutely right. The United States was incredibly weak on democratic institutions for the majority of its history, and yet, in other ways, stronger in liberal institutions. Mm -hmm. I wrote a long essay about Bayard Rustin yeah. not long ago. Rustin depended on the, li on the existing culture of the African-American friends mm -hmm. for everything else yes. that, happen that, that happened. Um, the only thing I'd add is that those 60-year convulsions can sometimes don't always hap happen on the right side. The Confederacy was a 60-year convulsion <laughs> right on schedule from the, oh, from, the, um, from the Constitution. And the, the, I say only then that there are moments for planning, but there are also moments for honest confrontation. Yes. I wrote a long essay as well about um, Lincoln and Douglas, and Fred Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, and we tend to fetishize or sentimentalize Lincoln's appetite for conciliation. But even more important was his readiness for confrontation. Mm -hmm. He recognized that there were certain moments in the life of the country where you could no longer simply tolerate, conciliate, and understand, where you had to be resolute in defense of democratic values, however limited right. they might have been. I think and believe that we are maybe in one of those moments and that I see it as my job to uh, continually try to aerate, amplify, enlighten the fight for those institutions. Okay, Karen? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, Absolutely I mean, on point. I have a, this is so thoughtful for a thing called vortex, <laughs> <laughs> which also means maelstrom, and it was started with the exorcist music. Did you all hear that? <laughs> Um, I think I'm a lot simpler person. Um, I think my role, um, you know, the, the, the traditional thing of journalists is uh, um, afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. That's not really my job, although I like to afflict the comfortable quite a bit as a personal thing. Um, but I think when I think about it, the thing I like to, the thing I say a lot to a lot of people is, oh, no, you don't. Like, I think I do that a lot with tech moguls mm -hmm. and right. stuff like that, or no. 
like what you're saying is pure bullshit right. or oh no you don't is what I think I do for a living. Like oh no, 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 that's not what's gonna happen. That's, that's not true, that's not this. And I think what the job of journalists today, and it's a very different job, is not just to repeat what people mm -hmm. say, it's not just to report on people who say, but also to try using reporting and reported analysis and not punditry, because that's a whole different thing. Um, to really take, to do really great reporting, do an assessment, and then come to a friggin' conclusion. I think what journalists tend to try to do is say, well, I can't yeah. decide. Balance on two, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna tell you, actually, mm -hmm. what Elon's doing right now is bullshit. Right. It's bullshit, and I'm sorry, it's toxic and ugly and gross. <laughs> you can clap or not, you can be on his side or not, but that's what I think. And so I think what you have to do is, once you get an assessment, or wh whoever it happens to be, whether it's AI, is to push back, not necessarily all the time, but also to support at the time. I like this, I don't like this, I don't do this. And, but it has to be from a place of really good reporting. And the other thing we can't be scared to do, and I think journalists really have, are on their back foot a lot more than they need to be, um, no one's ever liked a journalist since the beginning of our country, by the way, FYI. You know. After Watergate. Yeah, yes, they, they did, did for a short, brief right. moment, and they made a movie, and it was lovely, but it, mostly they don't like journalists, <laughs> is to stop, like, media is at all-time lows. Well, all right, fine. Like, I don't know what to say. So is the priesthood. So are congressmen. So are everything. I think what we have to do, and I think the, reason, the successful journalists of the future is, if, is they do amazing reporting and then tell it as truthfully as they can to people um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an information, you used to have an information desert, we now have an information flood and it is just as Delia, bad, if Delia, not right. worse. Right. And so when you have people in an information flood zone, they get so much information from everyone and they, before they didn't listen to it at all, your job is to say, here's what I know, you either take it or leave it and move on. I think that's really, we have to have a lot more courage as journalists not to worry so much about what people think of us. I, I mean, obviously I don't, um, but, uh, but I think it's, it's a, and back it up with really good, fair and accurate reporting. Mm -hmm. and, and then if you don't want to listen to it, you have my mother who loves Fox News, <laughs> that's fine. Okay, Mike, that's bring fine. us home. One of the reasons why I love Kara Swisher so much is because she's so fierce and her approaches her craft so fearlessly. Um, I'll, I'll answer the question by saying, you know, when, when eight of us got together and started the Lincoln Project, a lot of, thank you. I, I said that not for the applause line, but because I'm a little embarrassed that it took eight political consultants to be the moral backbone of the Republican <laughs> Party. <laughs> we'll take it. You'll take what you can get, right? Uh, but moreover, it wasn't that we were doing anything particularly courageous, it's that everybody was displaying such cowardice. <laughs> and and that, that is what I think was, is, is still so troubles me so deeply about what I learned about certainly the Republican Party, relationships that I had for 30, 40 years, but also just what our capacity is as human beings to let not, e not just each other down, but ourselves down. And these are those moments. These are those moments right now where we are all being tested to sacrifice and to show courage and to stand and be counted because history will, will be keeping score. History has its eyes on you. Yeah. Yeah. Sherilyn, Adam, Kara, Mike, thank you so much. Thank you. It should be legal and it should be rare. Union solidarity forever. Change is coming by disaster or change is coming by design. If you're not moved, you'll be subject to arrest. This is your third and final warning. Civil disobedience has to become the new normal. Hi, everybody. Well, of course, they saved the best for last. What can we say? Um, 
Jane, first of all, thanks so much for coming to the Ideas Festival. Oh my God, I'm honored to be here. I've only known Aspen for skiing. This is a whole new world, and I'm so honored to have been asked. Thank you, darling Tina. I'm so happy to be included. Well, hopefully you'll come back, but um, we have a lot to talk about. But before we dive into your current passion, uh, climate change, you are positively indefatigable. You have so much energy, woman, and inquiring minds want to know, <laughs> where does it well, come from? How do you do it? Well, I don't know. I take good care of myself. I, I eat well. I exercise. I sleep. I'm ashamed to say I sleep on average nine hours a night. But, no, that's uh, good. <laughs> truth be told, every neuron in my body is <laughs> energized to confront the climate crisis. I feel like this is what I was born to do, to use my platform in whatever way I can to confront the climate crisis. And so energy is what I'm, yeah, I mean, energy is what we're gonna talk about. And let, let's, let's talk about your work, because I think, first of all, you've been an activist your entire adult life, Jane. And I'm curious, did you have an epiphany or an aha moment that made you say, this has got to be my focus? for the rest of my life? Uh, where to begin? Well, I was born in 1937. We don't have to go far, that far well, back. Well, let me just, <laughs> <laughs> I was born in, I spent the first 10 years of my life in California. There were no freeways, there was no smog. There were only like 2 billion people in the world. I could swim safely in the ocean. It wasn't poisoned. Um, I, I was a tomboy and so I was, one with nature. I love nature. I love birds. I would go to sleep to the cry of coyotes. And then I left, and I didn't really come back to live in California, in Los Angeles, until I was in my 40s. I had two children. I remember when I first moved back, my eyes burned. My children developed asthma. I couldn't understand why everybody wasn't talking about this, but I realized it was because they'd gotten used to it. And that scared me. We lived near the ocean and near one of those runoffs that brings the wetness from the city down, God forbid, into the ocean. And the lifeguards were getting cancer. And um, when I was little, cancer was very rare. Nobody knew anybody that had cancer. And when we found out somebody had cancer, it would be whispered. And we'd call it the big C. They've got C. And suddenly in the 70s and 80s, I began to realize there was a cancer epidemic. And everybody either knew somebody that had cancer or had cancer or... <clears throat> but to be honest, I was looking at what was happening around me on the ground and I was concerned and I would march whenever there was a march or a protest. But it wasn't until five and a half years ago with the encouragement of a book by Naomi Klein called On Fire and reading about Greta Thunberg that I began to actually pay attention to the science. I, I'm ashamed to say that. And when I read the science, the reports, the IPCC reports, it was like a lightning bolt hit me. I realized the homework is right there. They're telling us with a clarion call what we have to do and how much time we have and, you know, I come from a long line of really depressed people. <laughs> and I was going down a rabbit hole. There was one day about five years ago in L.A., the sky was orange-brown because of the wildlife. Birds, I read, were falling out of the sky over Arizona and New Mexico. And I started to go down a rabbit hole of depression. And then I decided, fuck it. And I called Annie Leonard, who at the time was running Greenpeace, because they're the bravest of the big green organizations. And I said, I'm gonna, I want to move to D.C. and raise a ruckus. And first, I wanted to camp out. I was worried about where to poop, because I've pooped a lot in wilderness. I don't know how, to, what do you do in cities? I didn't know what to do. And she said, it doesn't matter because you can't, it's illegal now, you can't. You can't camp, uh, not poop, but you can't camp out in Washington. <laughs> so I went to Washington and, and for a bunch of months um, left my comfort zone, which is what Greta Thunberg said to do. And the goal was not government. The goal was we knew because of research that over 70% of Americans were concerned about climate. 
About 30% of them, when asked, said that they would engage in civil disobedience, nonviolent civil disobedience. And when asked why they didn't, they said, well, nobody asked me. So our target was the great unasked. And I, was, I turned 82 in jail during that time, and I knew that it would, it would wake some people up. Well, God, if she can do it, I can do it. And whip, hundreds of people would come from all over the country. Some came from Europe, mostly women, mostly with gray hair. And uh, it made a difference. And then when COVID hit, we continued um, online, and we had 9 million in 2020 and 10, 10 million in 2021. It made a difference. We trained them to be activists. Um, but here's the problem, you see, we, we, we weren't getting the policies that we needed that were commensurate with what science says we have to have. No new drilling, fracking, cut our emissions in half and gradually, not a sudden turn of the spigot, but gradually begin to phase out of fossil fuels so that by mid-century we'd be off fossil fuels. That was the homework. That's and right. And that's what I've been focused on. And, and according to a UN report, we have a chance to prevent the worst effects of climate change totally. if we quickly reduce carbon pollution and fossil fuel use by almost two thirds by 2035. So Jane, what happens if we don't meet that deadline? Well, we can still, if, we can still reduce the heat. Every half degree of heating that we can prevent will save hundreds of millions of lives. So we have to continue to fight to reduce the warming, to reduce our emissions. But we have to try to make it happen quickly and we can do it. That's the good thing is the scientist says, it's not too late, but it's gonna require a whole lot of people being very, very brave very, very quickly. And we can do that, right? <laughs> right. You know, I, I think I've done a lot of research in preparation for this interview, and I thought it was sad that less than 5% of adults see climate change as the single most important issue when it came to voting. Why is it so low? In I'm not view? sure that's true. I read yesterday that 63% of Americans think that climate is a very important thing to vote for. I know that people between the ages of 18 and 39, young people, um, in fact, I have some statistics here that I can share with everybody, that a recent NPR PBS poll found that nearly 60% of those between the ages of 18 and 29 yeah. believe climate change should be a priority, but less than 5% of adults rank climate change as the single most important issue. So we've got some work to do. How do we convince more people that this is such a, an important issue and they need to think about it when they're voting? I beg all of you, when you vote, vote with climate in your heart. This election in November is an existential election. What happens is going to determine a lot about what kind of future we leave our children. You know, I mean, we can leave our children inheritance. Isn't it better to leave them a planet? I think. Let's, let's talk about the candidates, because I know that uh, according to the New York Times, NPR, and the Wall Street Journal, and as well as a number of other sources, President Biden has done more to address climate change than any other president. This isn't framing, these are facts, everyone. Among his accomplishments, his administration has passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which is considered landmark legislation, includes $369 billion in energy security and climate change programs over the next 10 years. He's also finalized more than 100 new environmental regulations aimed at cutting air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, restricting toxic chemicals, and conserving public lands and waters. Having said that, what do you wish, what do you wish President Biden had done that he hasn't done? Well, he's tried. The, one of the most important things that he needs to do is to cut subsidies. We taxpayers give $20 billion every year to the industry that is killing our planet and us. That is unconscionable. And we have to stop. And if we do cut, 
the $20 billion that we give to the fossil fuel industry. It will make a huge difference. President Biden has tried to do it. It's the filibuster issue. But one of the things that we have to ask President Biden to do is to put a much more pressure to really champion this issue. And we have to then elect people to Congress and the Senate who will listen. You know, the, the fossil fuel industry gives hundreds of millions of dollars to our elected officials, just as many Democrats as Republicans. They have a stranglehold on our government. One of the reasons that I recently, start, three years ago, started the Jane Fonda Climate Pact, we elect people down ballot because that's where the robust work is, is, is happening. And when I say down ballot, I mean mayors, city councils, state legislatures, supervisors. These are the people that can really make a difference. And it's been stopped a lot because they're in the pockets of the fossil fuel industry. I was here earlier this year in Denver raising money for my PAC, and we visited Commerce City. I don't know how it, many of you have been to Commerce City. It's a community right next to, to Denver where the mortality is 25% higher than the rest of the country, where the air is poisoned. They've got Suncor, they've got Purina, and they have waste management. They are dying and they're not getting any help from the Colorado state legislature or governor. Nobody's listening to them. This is why we have to elect people at the county level, the local level, the state level, who will pay attention, who are not governing for corporations, but governing for people and people's health and children's health. Do you know that 93% of the children in the world breathe air that is so poisonous that it endangers their health and their development? 93%, one out of every five people that die in the world die because of fossil fuel related air pollution. It is, there's a climate crisis and right alongside is a robust health crisis. You know, the, the poisoned air doesn't know when they get to the street where Commerce City ends and then wealthy people live. We're all eventually going to be breathing poisoned air, drinking poisoned water. We can't escape it. So in we're fact, all in this together. I, I don't care what party you belong to. We all have to join in this November to save the planet. And then when, when that happens, then we can get together and figure everything out with, with all our differences. But for the sake of your children and the planet, vote with climate in your heart in November. And Jane, just to add, add to some of those figures, seven million people die every year from air pollution alone, not to mention the ha an estimated half million people who die from extreme heat, and clearly that number's increasing. Wildfires kill more than 300,000 people annually and thousands in floods worldwide. So I know that the health ramifications of climate change that's one of the things that yeah. really drew you to this issue. Uh, well, I got cancer. I was hoping my hair would fall out because oh, that's right. there'd be all this territory. I could tattoo climate emergency, you know? And, <laughs> and I, I, I hired someone to actually do it. And then I, Annie Leonard introduced me to a, to a climate activist who's, who said, no, 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 because the cancer community isn't gonna like that joining together with climate and this the hair didn't fall out anyway. It got curly. I mean, it's almost worth it to have, for me to have. <laughs> Looks curly. great. But I found out, I started doing research and found out the relationship between cancer and what's ha what we're burning fossil fuels that's, that's poisoning the air and the chemicals. It's not just, it's not just fossil fuels. I was recent, I spent three weeks in January making a documentary called Gaslit a good title, about what's happening in the Gulf states of Texas and Louisiana. Most people don't know this, but those states on the Gulf Coast is the number one climate bomb in the world. What that means is that the terminals that are already there and the ones that are going to be built if they continue will release one gigaton of carbon dioxide and methane. That's what it's going to do to all of us and to our planet. We are the number one exporter of gas and oil in the world. The United States is. It's, they justify it by saying it's, it's because of the war. The terminals started to be built before the war, and the war, please God, will end before the terminals are finished. 
dozens of terminals are already functioning and dozens more are waiting to be permitted. The, the terminals to receive our exported gas are all over the world. Thousands waiting to be permitted in Japan, all over the world. This, is, this will be it. This is why the most important thing that Joe Biden did, and it's not sexy and it wasn't headlines, was to create a pause. He paused exports of liquefied natural gas, which is basically liquefied methane. He paused it. And the other, I know you all read about how he had all the CEOs of the oil companies to, to Mar-a-Lago. And he said, if you give me a billion, I'll kill all the air, you know, all of the regulations, I'll do away with the EPA. The one thing that those CEOs cared about was the pause. Lift the pause. This is why every, all the people who are really making this their life focus like I am, the focus is on the Gulf. If we can stop this, if we can stop the exports, they're going to stop drilling. It's not for us, it's all for exports. And when they export gas, our gas prices go up, big time. They don't tell us that. But if we can stop that, if we can re-elect Biden and make him make the pause permanent, so much will be solved. This is a huge thing and a very brave thing that, that Biden did. So conversely, let's talk about uh, you know, obviously, we have an important election coming up. Uh, Existential it's, election. It's I've never thought that before, ever. Donald you know, Trump. You've always been able to think, well, you know, in four more years, then we don't have four years to lose, folks. Let's talk this about what Donald Trump has said about climate change. He's called it a hoax. His first administration weakened or wiped out more than 125 environmental rules and pulled the U.S. out of the Paris Agreement. If reelected, he's certain to do so again. And according to something called Project 2025, he will most likely gut the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which provides weather and climate forecasts and warnings. So talk about how you envision a future Trump presidency if he is, in fact, reelected, impacting climate change. What was that? A little Jewish thing, never mind. Um, I will ask all of you to Google Project 25. I did that last week, and I, I read three chapters, and I started shaking. It is a blueprint for fascism. Do away with the EPA. Dig this. Do away with the Department of Education. <laughs> and dismantle the government. It's a 90-page document written by 400 conservatives, many of them through the Heritage Foundation, that is ready to go. It's very granular. So many parts of government and so many government workers, the ones that have been there for a long time and know how to make things work, would be done away with. Please read it. I don't care what party you belong to. You need to know what's being planned if the orange man gets elected. And it will affect all of us. And he also said, I read last night, he was in a, the Orange Man was in an event last night and said he'd slash a thousand times taxes on the wealthy. You know, and I know that there's some, I'm sure that there's some people in, in this tent that would get a lot richer if that happened. But I've known a lot of very, very rich people. I've slept with some of them. And I... <laughs> And I know that <laughs> when you really get down to it, and I know it for myself because, you know, I'm close to the end, it's not the money that will make you go out happy. It's being surrounded by love, people who love you, not who you bought, but people who love you, and feeling that you've made a difference for the good in your life, having meaning. We all want meaning in our lives. And we can't, we can't continue. You know, the world is so different from what I described back in the 30s. We, we, we can't afford right now to only care about money. Greed is not good. We can get rich, we, but we don't need to get so rich that we sacrifice everybody else, and especially human beings in other parts of the world. You know, women are the most impacted by the climate crisis for all kinds of reasons. The legacy of colonialism, the legacy of gender 
injustice. We're always left behind. Women are the ones in most of the world who grow the food, plant the crops, harvest the crops, cook the food, find the water, find the wood, and droughts and fires and floods make their lives so much harder. They're the last because they stay behind to take care of communities and the kids. They're the last to be rescued. And then on fat, women have more body fat than men, and the pesticides that are in the air now everywhere, they live, they, they, harp, they take up residency in body fat. And that's why it's so dangerous, because we have it in our breast milk, we have it in the fetuses. It goes to the children when we, when we, when we feed. So we, we are the most impacted, we're also the ones that come up with the solutions for the most part. It started with Rachel Carson's. Historically, we've always been on the front of climate solutions. All over Africa, schoolgirls bringing solar heaters and light into their schools. Wangari Maathai with the Green Revolution in Kenya. It's women who are leading the way. That's why there were so many women. It moved me so much when I was for four and a half months in Washington getting arrested. All these gray-haired ladies kept coming around. It was Well, you wonderful. know, what was that experience like? You were arrested how many times, Jane, in I don't remember. But I think it was five. Look, I, we had many, many speakers of color at our rallies, and I noticed that they never engaged with our civil disobedience, and I know why. If you're a white movie star, they're going to treat you differently than if you're a black woman who nobody knows and they can do something and nobody knows about it. So that, you know, we were, it's not like it, it was down in the South at the lunch counters when they were engaging in civil disobedience. But we did, we, civil disobedience is great because, have, have, you, have any of you, when you watched a, you know, documentaries about really brave people, and they're getting beaten, or you know, dogs are attacking them, or they're they're risking their lives, and you wonder. I always do. Would I have been able to be that brave? This is our documentary moment. This is the moment where we can show our kids. We weren't just having manicures and massages and rearranging the china. We did everything we could. I want my children and grandchildren to know that. I can't remember what I started talking about. That's okay. <laughs> That's I've okay. lost my brain. <laughs> you, you were talking about women. You were talking about... Oh, yeah, women. Women. But, but we'll Jane, I wanted to ask you about RFK Jr. because he protested alongside you uh, for your fire drill Friday, right. Fridays in 2019. He was also arrested. What is your perspective on him and the campaign he's... Bobby has been a friend of my family's and me, and, you know, we really respected him as an environmentalist, but it doesn't really matter whether he... any of that. What matters is if you vote for a third-party candidate or you decide to sit it out, you are voting for the orange man, which means you're voting for fascism. <laughs> so appealing as Bobby may be, this is not the time, folks, to play around with somebody who's relying on, you know, his recent ancestors. You know, I mean, it's... We're the first generation that can do something, that have felt the effects of this, and we're the only generation left that can do something about it. So let's do something about it. We can still do something about it. It's not too late. And we can't do anything about it if we vote for Bobby Kennedy or Jill Stein or we decide to sit it out. It's too important. You have talked about... Um, Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Was it something I said? <laughs> <laughs> and you know what else? It's so disturbing. I was sitting in the audience and rows of people looking at their phone. <laughs> People can't put their phones down anymore. What is this? I don't. Th I think people is are it, all watching you, Jane. Is it I'm just because I'm old? Nobody's <laughs> looking at their phone right now. Um, you are such a force of nature, and you spend so much time doing this. I'm curious how you have educated yourself so much, and and how you would advise everyone in this room to educate themselves. Particularly, there is so much disinformation, so much contradictory information out in the, in the ether. You know, how would you recommend people, A, get involved, and B, educate themselves, or probably the well, other for, way around? You know, you, 
You don't have to be an expert. I, I'm just kind of a nerd. And I want to be like Greta when I grow up or when I shrink down or whatever. But I, you don't have to know everything. But you do have to know that now is the time. This is the pivotal election and this is the pivotal decade, what's left of it. This is what you have to know. Then, God, I mean, here in Aspen, everybody's thinking about climate. There's so many people you could talk to. There's books you can read. There's, um, I love how this stuff floats through. <laughs> <laughs> um, Those of us who can afford to buy electric vehicles should do so. That's what will make the cost go down. You know, when I started in the, in the 80s, early 80s, when I started the workout videos, the guy who, the only person that had ever done home videos was named Stuart Carl. They were home improvement videos. He asked me to do a video. I said, what's that? I didn't know anybody. That, that owned a VCR player. They were too expensive. And, and who would buy a VCR player when there was nothing that you really wanted to watch over and over? Then I made my video and suddenly, wealthy women first bought VCRs to do Jane and, and then the price dropped and everybody else got VCRs. And that's what we have to do with electric vehicles. And buy them and, and see there's a little slump right now. There was a big increase because wealthy people bought them, and now people are waiting for the price to drop, and all the, most of the automobile industries are working hard to make cars that are less expensive, and so they're buying, the hybrid market is up. It's a step before the others are more affordable, and there are more charging stations, but this is something you can do. Then you can stop using single-use plastics, obviously, and you can try to compost, and you, can, and you can grow your own food, and you can ride bikes, and you can stop flying in private pool. I couldn't believe flying into this airport. I haven't been here for decades. I, there are like four times as many private planes as there used to be back in the good old days. Did you fly here commercial? Huh? Did you fly here commercial? Yeah, I only fly commercial, yeah. Right, and so, you know, just right now, the most important thing that every one of us can do is vote for climate and pay attention to down ballot races. Find out if the, cli if the person you're thinking of voting takes money from the fossil fuel industry, you can find that out. Elect people who care about you, care about, American people and nature and not beholden to corporations. Jane? How many people promise that they'll <laughs> vote with climate in their heart? Raise their hand. <laughs> yeah, wow, okay, good, thanks. <laughs> That's great, really do it. I was gonna ask you, we, on, we only have a, a minute and 30 seconds left, you know, Tomorrow night, there's going to be a very important debate uh, between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. A lot has been made of Joe Biden's age and his. I'm older than of, he is. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the number. It's not the number. You know, first of all, a president sets, sets the trends and everything, but the people who run the government are not the president. They're the, they're the what do you call them? Cabinet. Cabinets. And the, and the you know, those people. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the question? No, I was going to ask you about questions about Joe Biden's age. Oh, yeah. You've, you've, I, it doesn't and I matter. You to opine it doesn't matter. On that criticism. I'm furious with Joe Biden. I am furious. He promised when he was running for president that he would do away with that he would do everything to get rid of the 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 things that we pay twenty billion dollars a year, whatever they are. <laughs> that he was going to do. For example, 
he hasn't lived up to everything, but he's been a historic climate president. He's done more than any other president has for climate. And it doesn't really matter. What matters is if Joe Biden is our next president, we have a voice. He provides us with a context in which we can fight and he can be pressured. He launched the pause that I talked about that stops exporting methane around the world because people from Cancer Alley, black people and Hispanic people went to DC and pressured and fought. So did a lot of big donors, by the way, too. It was a combination, but he can be pressured. You can't do that with fascism. We lose our ability to fight. You fight and you go to jail. So it doesn't matter that he's old. It doesn't matter that he stutters. None of that matters. What matters is he gives us the possibility of a future that we lose if the other guy wins. And whether you're a Republican or Democrat, keep that in your heart and your head. Jane Fonda, you still got it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let's walk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jane didn't really need me here at all, but I was happy to share the stage with her. This concludes our afternoon of conversation. Evenings at Ideas is now starting in the Marble Garden. Um, thank you all so much for coming today. And one more round of applause for Jane. Thank you.